Hey everyone, this is Nate Laux, and you're listening to the Summer Friends Podcast. So it's been a while since I've posted an episode. The holidays got the best of me. But I'm hoping to be a regular poster in 2019. I started this podcast because I needed a hobby. And since I love talking to you and meeting people, I thought this would be a great way to take up a hobby and do some good. Last I checked, 500 or so of you are subscribed to the podcast in various platforms. And while I'm still a few million below Mark Merritt, I'm coming for you, Mark. I'm a few hundred above where I thought I'd be. So thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy this year's slate of episodes. Today I have a conversation with my friend Joe Ruiz. Joe makes music under the name Rhymer Educator. Last year, after being prodded by some students who discovered some of Joe's music online created years ago, he dusted off the microphone and got back into the game. But this time, he brought his students and his community along with him. In this episode, we talk about having a Hispanic dad and a white mom, how his love of music started, creating his first real album in his 30s, and all kinds of other things. It was a lot of fun to spend some time with my friend Joe, learning about his story and what makes him tick. So enjoy this episode. And let me introduce you to my friend and your new summer friend, Rummer educator, Joe Ruiz. So I am here with uh, the Rummer educator, Joe Ruiz, and we're going to talk a little bit about his life and how he has got to this point sitting across from me. Good. I feel like this is going to be one of those vulnerable, bare soul kind of interviews. So I have a goal at the end of every interview. I it's the I put it through the Barbara Walters test. Uh-huh. Did I get them to cry? Yeah. I have gotten a few to cry. I'm not like good at it yet. I've been watching a lot of tape from Barbara Walters to see <laughs> if I can maybe adopt some things and then get get to that point. But so Joe uh, Ruiz, Rhymer Educator, where does that name come from? Well, I wanted something that was straightforward and I wanted something that wasn't already being used. So I am a teacher, thus the educator, and I am a rapper, thus the rhymer. Rhymer Educator sounded better than Educator Rhymer. <laughs> Uh, so we just went with it and it wasn't being used, which was great. I'm fortunate that I, you know, thought of it because when you Google Rhymer Educator, it's all me. Like I really don't have to share it with anybody. When I was thinking of the name for this podcast, the Summer Friends podcast, it was all about every summer when I was a teenager, I would meet people that were either, especially in this area, we have a lot of people from Chicago that stay in Michigan City or New Buffalo. Undoubtedly, I'd meet someone that was an acquaintance just for the summer, Mm -hmm. but then they'd either go back to Chicago or they'd go, they'd move away. But that impact they had when they were with you was palpable. It was a real impact, but it doesn't mean that you're going to be best friends forever. Yeah, there's single, single, serving friends absolutely they, yeah i had like 17 names i was going over and i was giving them to my wife i'm like what about this one and she thought almost all of them were dumb except this one it's very vulnerable to like pick a name though isn't it to say okay this will be my name i wonder what people will think of it yeah i had people ask me for the longest time like well what's your rap name and i was almost embarrassed to to throw anything out there hip-hop is a funny thing because it's all about well it's hip is the first part of it right so it's about trendiness it's about things that are dope and when you when you when you throw something out there how many lils are there how many youngs are there you know lil something young something it's it's so saturated but at one point like that was trendy and there's more followers than there are trendsetters in hip-hop despite it being an art form that's supposed to be hip yeah and so i'm like well what can i choose this project has been about staying true to who i am and what i like Musically, poetically, morally, I'm a rhymer. I'm an educator. Rhymer educator. I picked a rap name. Did I tell you that? <laughs> no. Why are you laughing? <laughs> I just want to see where this is going to go. I picked a name called Nate Dog. Well, which is already taken. But I feel like it can be shared. Yeah. Well, it's not being used currently. Here's the thing. I think Nate Dog was with D O double G, right? Yeah. I'm just going to go with one G, D O G. Okay. And see where that takes me. I, I feel like somebody needs to pick up that mantle. Mm-hmm. And I am that someone. We're born for special things, I think. And that's the thing I'm born for. So, Well, I think there are, there are two Dr. Dre's. Like a, like a real Dr. Dre? No, no, no. Like, well, there's a, yeah, there's a real Dr. Dre, too. Dr. Andre something. And he calls himself Dr. Dre. But there's also two 
uh, famous people that use that moniker, although one is significantly more famous than the other. Yeah, because I've only heard of one of them. Yeah, but I mean, I've seen the other one on TV and stuff back in the 90s. But people might not know this, but I've been... I've been petitioning you for quite some time to get in on this rap game with you because I feel like I would be really good at being a hype man doing the uhs and the come on, come ons, you know, the thing like that. But you haven't quite taken me up on that. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, because it's conditional on whether or not you're willing to swing a towel or a shirt on stage and you haven't given me confirmation of that yet. Can I still wear a shirt when I do it? <laughs> yeah, I suppose, but you have to, you, when you take your shirt off to swing it, you, you can wear a, uh, a white tank top like the rappers do and possibly a do-rag also. Um, but that's optional. Who is your favorite rapper right now? Common, always. Why? Common has always done his own thing. Like, I think even when in the 90s, rappers were, it's, it's, it's an art form that's by and large been a lot about self-indulgence. Look at what I have. And I think a lot of that comes from the fact that the art form originated in the streets in a place where a lot of people were the have-nots rather than the haves. And so when they began to acquire wealth and money, they bragged about it in the art form. You know what I mean? And so uh, Common never chose to go with the trends that were popular in the moment. He was uh, a poet and he was all about wordplay and lyricism. And he did things in his own style. He did things in his own way. Um, he's he, still doing things, right? Or he's no? still doing things in his own way. Yeah. And I mean, even more now because he's got a bigger platform and he's kind of transitioned to where music is just this thing he does, but he's also acting and he's, you know, he's an activist and he's creating nonprofits and he's amazing. Is he from Chicago? He is. Yeah. Yeah. He's Chicago just creates the best artists. Do you think, cause I would, you know, chance of rappers from Chicago, lots of uh, no names from Chicago, right? No names from Chicago. Yeah. Saba. Cause right. It used to be an East coast, West coast thing, right? Yeah. Do you think right now Chicago is creating some of the greatest rappers? I think Chicago always has, you know, Kanye was from Chicago, you know, and despite what he's doing right now, like he has a place in hip hop history. You know, he's got some very classic albums out there, but there's always been great artists that came from Chicago. Uh, Twista was a big deal for a while. He's from Chicago. Do or Die were from Chicago. They were kind of cool for a moment. Um, there's always just been an art scene that's been generated there, not even just in hip hop, but like look at some of the greatest people from Saturday Night Live came out of the Second City there. Second City is huge. You yeah. know, and, and so comedians, like it's just, there's an artistic community that thrives in that setting and, and they just shoot people out that are ridiculously talented. Tell me about where you come from. Are you born and raised in LaPorte County? I was born in Pasadena, Texas, right outside of Houston. I moved here when I was six. Uh, my parents divorced and I moved to LaPorte because that's where my mom's family lived. I grew up here ever since then. I didn't leave LaPorte until uh, 2000, 2004 when I went to Bethel College. And then I kind of stayed in the Mishawaka, Indiana area um, until I moved back here to accept the job at LaPorte High School. Your parents divorced when you were how old? I was about six years old. And did your dad stay in Texas? Yeah, he stayed. That was a big reason, I think, for the divorce was my mom's family was here. They were very tight. Um, her dad wanted her back here, my grandpa, and my dad's life was there. He didn't like it up here. He wanted the warmth and uh, you know the nearness, proximity to the big city and all the things that were going on in Houston. He was studying down there uh, for some things and he didn't want to leave. And so they, there was like a trial separation where they were both in their respective places and my mom would go back there and he would come back here and it seemed like every other month I was on an airplane one way or the other. Um, and then eventually they were just like, this isn't working, I called it quits. Is your dad from Texas? He's been in Texas forever now, so I would say he's a Texan. But no, he, he growing up more in Chicago. And um, so I guess that's another reason why maybe he wasn't impressed with 
saying, like, well, Chicago is close to where we live here. You know, like he, that was nothing to him. He kind of grew up there. But then uh, before that, as a baby um, on the island in Puerto Rico. Before nine, I imagine what was on the radio. It was placed there without my consent. But maybe after nine, I began to craft a pen. and played a DJ everywhere that I went. Before nine, I imagine what was on the radio. It was placed there without my consent. But maybe after nine. You are half Puerto Rican. Is and this is really ignorant of me, but this this is what this podcast is. Just me throwing my ignorance around. Uh, do you consider yourself a minority? Yes. I consider myself when you fill out your forms, do you fill out uh what what do you fill out? That's the hard part, right? Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. I get kind of mad in that yeah, I feel like a minority because I've always felt not Latino enough for Latinos and not Caucasian enough for Caucasians. And when you ask me to fill in a circle or a box and you don't have both options for me to place, then I have to decide which one I align with. So, you know, like um, ethnicity wise, yeah, I've got these Spanish roots that I'm getting closer to as I get older. But like culturally, I was raised with my mom, who is a white woman. So you're raised by a white mother. Mm -hmm. You are mixed race. Uh, You are Latino and white. Were you ever reminded of those differences growing up? Yeah. So if I got if, if I ever get too comfortable one way or the other, something happens to remind me of kind of where I stand in all that, you know, like, uh, it was easy enough to say, okay, I'm being raised by a white family. I live in a predominantly white area. You know, I went to a predominantly white college. When I went to college, one reminder was they stuffed me in this thing that they, at the time, they called the House of Higher Learning, which is where they took anybody that was even like resembling a minority, but wasn't on the soccer team. And they put them in <laughs> Even those house. that looked really tan, they may have confused and put in there as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. It was like the real world. <laughs> For Bethel College, you know, uh, like they just put us all in one house to see how we'd interact. And then they had advisors who would come in and talk to us once a week and have these um, meetings with us about like racial reconciliation and things. Do you think people, do you think in hindsight, right? Because that seems remarkably racist to me because we put everyone in a mi- yeah. <laughs> everyone that's a minority yeah. in their own minority house. Yeah. Now we called it like a house of higher learning, like you said. Right. But it looks like from the outside... Because Bethel College was predominantly a white evangelical school, yeah, we put all of our <laughs> we we herded all of our minorities yeah. into one student. Did it feel like yeah. that? And then they talked to us about racial reconciliation, and it's like we all get along just fine. We need to reconcile with the rest of the college, like not with each other. We're good. Take us out of this little herd you've put us yeah. in and release us yeah. into the world. The thinking was crazy, and I, I know the advisors were like well-meaning good people but everything that they said was just like it it would all just seem so elementary and we all got along great when we would go to the rest of like the chapels and different things and they would try to present sometimes it wasn't like uh no but people didn't necessarily feel like there was like an equal representation in the way that content was put on people all the time you know you know where there'd be little things like i'm like okay i'm i guess i just feel pretty white sometimes because I'm just raised around it all culturally. And like, I've, I've not had a lot of the, the things that I might hear like an African American say that they've been involved in these situations where they've experienced this really unjust racism. And, but then, you know, like I remember going down uh, main street in Mishawaka to pay my electric bill and this, uh, car drove by with the window down really nice day. And this guy yelled out spick. And I was just like, for real. And I, I like, I immediately had to check myself. I'm like, Oh yeah. Right. So there's this, There's this part of me like that's just not good enough for some people. I definitely know that I've been pulled over and harassed a couple of times just based off of maybe my last name. And it's it's just funny how when people look at things on a piece of paper and they make assumptions based on, you know what I mean? Because if you talk to me, I mean, I, I am what I am and there's nothing threatening about me in any sort of way. But I've been talked to by a couple of South Bend Police Department officers that you know, treated me like because uh, I had a Hispanic last name, like I was going to be something that was threatening to them. And it's like, that's ridiculous. You know, like I remember I was Uber driving when I was working on my teaching license 
And one night I had a car full of Notre Dame students that I was trying to safely get en route to a bar that they were going to. And I guess a taillight had gone out on my car or a turn signal. And, uh, and next thing I know, I see the berries and cherries in my rear view and I'm like, ah, okay. You know, I pull over and, and he comes up and where are you headed? And I, I said, well, I'm just taking these kids. I'm an Uber driver. I'm just taking these kids over to Finney's. And, um, and he says, you got a taillight out. And I said, oh, I do. I wasn't aware of that. Um, you know, if you want, I can just run to Walmart real quick. I'll pick up a replacement bulb and put it in, uh, you know, so there's no trouble. And he goes, oh no, you got to get a ticket. And I was like, why do, why do I have to get a ticket? I wasn't aware that, you know, and so you're, you're telling me this for the first time that I've heard it, you know, and now I'm telling you that I'll go fix it immediately so that I can keep working. But he gives me a ticket and it's for, you know, like $80 or something crazy. And I'm like, well, that may be more than I make tonight now, depending on the fares. And so, uh, I did go replace it and then I had to go contest it in traffic court and sit there for like three, four hours one day and just waste my day waiting for some attorney to talk to me and then hear my story and write it off. I don't know how to explain it, but there's a sense about when situations like that happen and you know that there's something more behind it than just like a taillight. You know what I mean? Like there, there are like these invisible biases and you can just feel them. And I don't know that you could really explain that to anybody who doesn't yeah, already feel I don't know if I can feel them. I'm a six, five white dude that most people are intimidated by, though they ought not to be. Yeah. But I believe you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I, and this is the hard thing with, in the position that I'm in, when I talk to people who go through these kind of injustices, because you know it's a passion of mine to uh, bring up people and to, you know, if I can use my influence to help others who don't have influence to do that, these kind of things. But I don't get this. This is the, this is why it's so important and why I believe in this podcast, because I don't get this. I don't, I don't go through this. I've gotten pulled over a couple of times, all for, for good reasons. I mean, I was speeding, but honestly, most didn't give me a ticket. I do think this exists. Those of us that are white need to listen to our brothers and sisters who aren't because I think these are real things that are happening. I think that's been like the confusingness for me. Like, you know, I have like kind of a lifelong identity crisis with this, right? Where there's times where I feel like I can walk into a 7-Eleven and give a cop a head nod and like feel like totally comfortable and cool. And then there's times where situations like that happen and I feel that and I'm like, this is that. That really hard to articulate thing that people talk about. And you hear people who are not biracial talk about it more and and you're just like man like so those little glimpses that i get of that that i get to feel that i feel bad for people who have to who have to deal with that like all the time and that's just their day-to-day -day life because I, I only get it half the time your dad's a pastor well he's a retired pastor now okay yeah so he's gonna be 66 here i think he just kind of helps out at the church more than anything he was studying to be a pastor but i from what i understand and you know my memories aren't great i think he was still working through some personal demons so even though he felt like he had a path kind of for himself and he knew where he wanted to go, he hadn't totally reconciled that with who he had been. And so there was a growing period where maybe he didn't do the job the way that the job should be done. He wasn't around a lot. He was always off doing who knows what. And he's a, he was a mover and a shaker. You know, Papa was a rolling stone. And, uh, and my mom, 13 years younger than him, um, she, she just didn't really have a good handle on life. She had me when she was 20. She was very young. I think she was very naive. My mom was pretty much kept inside the house to raise the baby. You know, she didn't have a license. She didn't drive herself around. She really didn't have any friends. I was always looking for attention. You know, I don't think that's really left me. Um, and I remember this one scene where I put on some sunglasses and this like canary yellow cardigan. And I think there's a picture of me somewhere where I had this like little uh, Casio keyboard. And one day when church was letting out, all of these people were kind of standing around in our yard talking. And, uh, and I went outside with my sunglasses on playing these presets and just like playing music. And I thought I was a rock star and all these people were looking at me and everything. I don't even remember anybody saying anything to me about it. But just the fact that I was playing music in a place where there was a lot of people, I felt like I had all the attention that I wasn't getting from 
my father or my parents or whatever. And that stuck with me for some reason. What did that do to your relationship with faith and religion then? How was that growing up? So, well, we moved back here to Laporte and we were always in, my mom, like the, the churches that we were involved with down there were, I don't know what umbrella they fell under, but I know that there was uh, a lot of very mysterious things happening in religion that were treated as commonplace. But like, if you showed them to somebody who is outside of that bubble would look really uh, supernatural or ridiculous, maybe, you know, the speaking in tongues and the laying of hands and the uh, prophesying over one another. And a lot of people telling a lot of people what their future held for them or what tomorrow held for them or what they needed to do. And all of this was directed by God through them, you know? And then we moved here and we got involved in very similar churches. We were in the Church of God or Assemblies of God and a lot of those same things were happening. And I never questioned it. I was just a kid, you know? I went to church with my mom or whatever and I never really questioned it, but I was very used to seeing it. And it, and it probably wasn't until I was a teenager and I kind of stopped going to church as much. And then when I eventually went to Bethel and I saw the missionary church operated very differently from those churches that I'd grown up in, and it was just much more community and friendly, and there wasn't a lot of that speaking in tongues and things going on. And, and then I, I've even kind of become less, you know, I go here. I go to, to State Street, and it's community service and outreach doing nice things for people, taking care of people and feeding people. And it's a faith with skin on. Yeah. I've never felt so close to God in the sense that like, Hey, people that I'm around are always trying to do nice things for people and treat people the way that Jesus would have. Because in all of those church situations, there was a lot of legalism. You know, you can do this, but you can't do this. You can, you know, even at Bethel, you can't share a blanket with a person of the opposite sex. You can't watch rated R films. Do you know what happens if you share blankets? What's that? Dancing. Dancing comes next. So <laughs> we couldn't dance either. <laughs> yeah, no, no dancing. When I was there, it was at the advent of social media, and they blocked Facebook because they just weren't sure what that was. And really? Yeah, like it was, it was a boogeyman for a moment. And I know, I think social media is fine now over there, but you know, it's because you can't escape it. But like there was a time where they blocked it. They just said, what is this thing that all these college students are getting on and we don't understand it, shut it down. Uh, nothing good can come from it. And I, I was frustrated because like I was really into it for a moment and then all of a sudden it was gone. I was like, oh, I can't even get on my MySpace page. You know, like this is crazy. So know. when you stopped going to church then in like in high school, yeah. was it just uh, an apathy or was it, uh, I don't know if this gels with me intellectually or... What, what was it? Just, I'm busy. I'm a high schooler. This isn't really where I, where I want to be. Well, it was that. It was, I, I was busy. I was with friends. I was doing other things. But like, uh, I'd never had any sort of deep intellectual or existential conversations with myself that I, that I know of. It was the biggest conversation that I've had, no matter what, to bring it back is, where do I fit in? Do I fit in at all? Who do I fit in with? Uh, let's go back and talk a little bit about Puerto Rico. A couple of you, what, two years ago two now, a year ago. and a half ago? Right you, before Hurricane Maria. Was that your first trip to Puerto Rico? This is my first time, yeah. And you have uncles there? I've got two uncles there. And I have a third who lives in Chicago most of the time, but he also has a house there. So he went down there too when we visited. Did you learn anything about yourself when you were down there? Or did you connect with anything that you didn't know existed within you when you went to Puerto Rico? You know when uh, you hear African Americans talk about visiting Africa, like Dave Chappelle went off to Africa when he was real stressed out. He's, he said he was visiting like the motherland or whatever, and he's just getting in touch with his roots, and he felt like a sense of, almost like a spiritual sense, like a, a feeling complete. I kind of felt like that when I was there, and I'm looking at these hills. My uncle still lives on the same plot of land where uh, and my dad comes from a family of 13. 13 brothers and sisters. There's this thing about people from that generation, and I don't know if it's just Puerto Rican people from that generation or whatever, but they blur history and they revision history and they don't want to talk a lot about 
themselves when they were younger and they're very they have very like st- like a strict sense of self privacy and we were doing like our genealogy research and our ancestry.com stuff and just asking questions was like pulling teeth because there's so much that they don't want to give away and so while we're on this kind of soul searching like see what, where what, my, real quick Joe why is that why why do you think that I don't want to give you this I don't know I I just don't know uh, my dad says when we were brought up you minded your own business. There wasn't all the social media. You lived your life. You did your thing. You didn't tell people all of your personal information. You just, you kept it to yourself. It's not like you're asking random people, right? It's not me going to do a podcast down there and tell me, tell me your story, which I would get people be like, you know, you, you, you haven't earned the right to hear my story. Right. But you're like, okay, we, we share like a a name and DNA. I just want to know this because this is what we do for our ancestors. We share our stories, right? Yeah. I would get my uncles sharing stories. Often they would be talking about the same thing, giving different accounts. It's just kind of like, well, who's right? Who's telling me the right, the right thing here? It's hard to know. You know, and my dad was in Vietnam. So like there's, there's like a, a section there where I get that he doesn't want to talk about it at all. He doesn't want to discuss his time as a Marine because he probably saw some things that he doesn't want to revisit. And I, and I know that that's very common among soldiers of that era. So when he tells me, I don't want to talk about that, I get it. I respect it. But like, tell me about when you were a little kid, you know, I think it was a large family who was very poor. And I see pictures of all of these kids in like a little one bedroom house that's barely a house. And uh, you know, and they tell me stories about, and I got to see this hill, you know, right in front of my uncle Nelson's house that he built. And it's like, you know, he's, our grandparents lived there, our parents lived there. You know, we had to, in order to go to the bathroom, go down the hill, there was a well, there was an outhouse, you know what I mean? And like, to think about that is kind of insane. And then when they moved to Chicago for opportunity, what that opportunity became was my grandpa basically bailed on my grandma and left for a long time. And I suspect maybe had another family somewhere out there. You know, there's signs that point to that. Because 13 kids with your grandma wasn't enough? Wasn't enough, I guess. (laughs) But he left her to raise all of these children. And so I think... In Chicago. In Chicago. I suspect that people did things that they weren't always proud of to survive because they felt like that's what they had to do. And when they don't want to talk about their lives, those are the things that they're trying to forget about. Because where they're at now, none of them are in the same position. You're, you know, they, they've made more money. They've got up in life. Seems unfathomable to yeah, them. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there was probably like an element of crime. And now they're older and they've got some more perspective. In my dad's case, found religion, you know. Jack Pearson, the trucks survived, the end is near. Somebody tried to tell me there was nothing to fear. But since our physical bodies were safe, I thought of several ways that I could be afraid. Like, what does it cost to be saved? It's almost 1A until the next day. No insurance company they can answer to how we can pay questions. Was meant no assurance. I need a blessing. Beyond at least we're all alive. How does my family thrive? When all belongings, everything we've acquired in life is subject to be cloaked in smoke. What's the damage inside? I saw them open the side door from the basement. More Haze rolls unfazed and made their way in to the stairwell. Take care where the smell seems dangerous to inhale. My when life goes up in flames, so you're young, you bring out your Casio keyboard. Yeah. You Billy Joel this thing. Yeah. Did you actually play or were you just playing like the sounds that came with it? Oh, I was, you know, so little. Like I wasn't playing anything. I was just hitting presets and then probably sure. probably hitting some keys to supplement it. But it was probably making more noise than it was anything melodic. Did you love the music or did you love the attention? Both, probably. Yeah. When did you get into wanting to be a musical type of person? I, re- I just realized that I had a lot of fun singing but I never told anybody about it. And you know, like early nineties, I'm probably like eight or nine. And there was that, uh, there was this, I guess they were a boy band or like an R and B group or something called all for one. Oh yeah. Do I know all for one? Yeah. They had that. I swear. Yeah. I remember sitting in the East side. Dance to a lot of middle school dances in that one. Yeah. Oh yeah. And so I remember sitting in the East side produce parking lot while my mom was getting some groceries and that song was on the radio and I was singing it and I was like, 
belting it, singing all the little runs and stuff to the best of my ability. In in my opinion, it's the only way to sing it is to belt that song. Yeah. And my mom comes out and she sees me doing this. My eyes are closed, so I'm not noticing that. Because you're so be like enwrapped into the song. I'm in it. Yeah. Uh-huh. And and she just goes, I never heard you sing before. You really seem like you were into that. And then so we lived in a trailer park and there was a kid down the street who had a family that sang at church and stuff. He also rapped and danced and did like everything. And I would just listen to him do it. And I thought like, man, this is so cool. I wish I could do all that, you know? He brought me to his house one time and he had this like shed behind his house that we like turned into our fort. We had like a hot plate and we would make like ramen noodles or grilled cheeses. We would sit back there and listen to music. And there was like a couch in it. How old are you roughly? 10. And he was just like, what what song was it at the time that was that was kind of popular? Is uh, who is it by? I'm pretty good at this game. I want to say this would have been like when Mariah Carey made the song with Boys to Men. Oh yeah, oh yeah, classic. You know? yep. And 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 he goes, all right, sing this part, the Mariah Carey part, uh, one of the Boys to Men parts. Okay, I sang it, and he goes, whoa, 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 wait a second. No, oh, that was pretty good. And he goes and he grabs his big sister, who was a teenager, and I thought she was kind of pretty. And so he's like, sing this for her real quick. And so we did this like little part where he sang a part and then I sang a part. And she was just like real encouraging, like, wow, that was really good and stuff. And I'm like, well, if the pretty teenager tells me that I'm singing this well, like this is, I like that attention. And so like he and I just started singing together and stuff. I never rapped. He always rapped. I never rapped. I wasn't, I wasn't brave enough, but I thought it was so cool that he could do both things. And, and so it wasn't later on until I tried to do that. But I loved rap music. Even like as a 10-year-old, I asked my parents if I could buy a Tupac CD. They said no, because they thought I was going to join a gang if I listened to Tupac. So I remember I would just listen to the radio. And I don't know why the two songs of that time that stick out to me are In the Still of the Night, which is a Boys to Men cover, and Gin and Juice by Snoop Dogg. Great song. Yeah. And Snoop Dogg was, that was, that was like the first rap song that I remember myself really like falling in love with for some reason. It was something about the beat and like how chill he was with his delivery. And, and at 10, you were probably a pretty big fan of Gin and Juice, right? <laughs> I had, I don't even know what it was. <laughs> I didn't know, like all the stuff he was talking about, like when I listen back to it now, I'm like, man, that sounds like the wildest party. And I've never <laughs> been to anything remotely like that. You know what I mean? But like that. I don't know, man, like there was a, there's something about my brain that with music at least has been able to always be really objective. Like it wasn't about, I want your story to become my story. It was just like, man, you've got this dope way of telling people your story and I want to tell people my story and I don't even really totally understand my own story or, or know, know my story, you know, and we talked about that a little bit earlier, like, and so, and, and how could I, put that into words and articulate it definitely better than I can in a conversation, right? Where we just kind of spider web from one thing to another. And maybe I'll walk away from this and I'll probably think like, Oh, I should have said that, or I I could have said this better, or I could have explained this better. And I probably won't want to listen back to myself. Um, but, but then the idea of like writing these things out, it's like, yeah, and then I can be strategic about it, you know? And so I began to write and I also began to be a black market, uh, rap cassette smuggler where, I, you know, like I would just sit by my radio until a rap song came on with a blank cassette tape and push record. And my parents who told me I couldn't buy the Tupac CD, suddenly I had all these tapes with rap songs that they didn't know about. And I would just hide them in a pillowcase, you know, so <laughs> all this stuff going on. And when they weren't around, I would listen to rap music and it became this like forbidden fruit, you know, and I would not try to emulate the what the people were talking about, but like, I would definitely try to write my own story down lyrically and like put it into words the way that they did. And then, um, there were like a lot of iterations of musically, like where I wanted to be. So like when I was 14, um, boy bands were really popular, Backstreet Boys, NSYNC. And so like, I said, okay, I'm watching TRL every single day and people are talking about it when I go to school. And the boy band seemed to be the most popular with the ladies. I seen that. I did a lot for for the attention from females, and um, and I never really had girlfriends and stuff, so I'm not really sure you know what that was about. But probably just being a teenage boy, I'm guessing. And uh, and so I remember I started a boy band, right? 
Really? Well, yeah, we were the phase. We were, you know. Did you spell that any differently? Like, did you use Z or anything? No, no, it was just the phase. And, you know. How uh, many members was there? There were five, because that's what you needed in a boy band. Did you break it up into parts? Did you have, like, a guy doing the low part? And, like, or did you? We never got that far. Okay. You know, we all just kind of sang. So I, I found these other guys. I found two guys that could sing well. And two guys who I knew that girls thought they were cute. Mm -hmm. And they really couldn't sing well. But, like, they fit the mold. So I remember a couple, there were like, we call that the Joey Fatone. Yeah. And so I remember we would, we, at, at a Michigan city junior high school, there was this tunnel that kind of went underneath from one building to another. And like the cafeteria was kind of in like a basement area. And then so you, to get back to your classes, we had to walk up these stairs and we would stand at the stop of the, at the top of the stairwell and we would sing these songs that I wrote which were looking back like these really embarrassing, like cheesy, predictable rhymes. And like, do you remember any of them? Yeah. There was like one, it was let me, let me be the one to hold you safe in my arms. Let me be the one to something to keep you from harm <laughs> or something like that. Just like real generic, you know, but like it worked. If you would have taken a snapshot, it would have been this funny picture of these five guys singing with a circle of girls around them holding their books and like smiling and listening. And then about 20 feet away in the background was like a cluster of guys looking at us with disgust. Right. <laughs> and, and so like, uh, it was effective, you know, but it was short lived. The band broke up the band. Yeah. Well, was, everybody had things going on, you know, and like it really, it was thrown together. So nobody was really committed to it. And, and I think probably some of the guys just uh, surrendered to like the pressure of other guys saying you're not cool because you're part of this boy band. And then the Latin explosion happened. Ricky Martin. Ricky Martin, Mark Anthony, Jennifer Lopez, mm -hmm. even like Big Punisher, you know? I don't know Big Punisher. Oh, he's like one of the greatest hip hop lyricists of all time. He was this really heavy dude from Brooklyn and he, and he was like insane lyrically go back and listen to some big fun yeah, he had a big i don't want to be a player no more i'm not a player but it's crush a lot it was like a big hit for i might remember it if i listened to it okay. Okay. not that your your iteration your version wasn't good was just i'm just throwing it out yeah that was like the first time i was like holy cow like there's puerto rican artists who are like getting really popular and they're making this kind of music so maybe i should make that kind of music make latin music but then I was like, ah, but I don't know any Spanish, you know, like they, they all, they're all bilingual and they're singing songs. They've been to Puerto Rico. They've grown up there. Like I got none of that. And so I, then somehow or another, I remember hooking back up with Chris, who was the kid who as a kid convinced me to sing in our little shed. The, the hot pan kid. Yeah. Hot plate. Hot plate. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I ran into him again and he came back over to my house and was like showing me some new stuff that he was working on and he's rapping. And I'm like, man, still, still wish I could do that too, you know? Cause I love rap music at that point. I love all music, but like there's something about rap music. And there was this thing on uh, HBO maybe, it was called like Deaf Poetry. It was run by Russell Simmons' Deaf Jam, but they would have people come in and do like spoken word, poetry which was basically hip-hop without a beat you know and, uh, and that was cool and i would watch that and i'm like so what i ended up doing was i would turn on these jazz music stations because i didn't have any beats and so i would just turn on jazz because there was no vocals even though the music was all over the place i would drive around and just try to freestyle to these jazz beats i was never the best freestyler i'm still not the best freestyler but like the more you do it the more competent you know you get at it and um then I began to write again, and then I kind of had two friends, John, who I mentioned before, and Garrett, his best friend, and they came over to my house one time, and we wrote a song, and we formed a very short-lived rap group called the MC3, and we wrote a song. It was like it was like a Christian rap song. That really went well. We recorded it on a laptop computer on John's Dell, and he had like a Sony Acid Pro program that we recorded on a little mic, and we put like a sock over it as a pop filter, and you know, it was this real like homemade amateur does it does it still exist somewhere oh yeah i got a copy and uh occasionally i'll just like text it to them and 
try and catch him off guard out of nowhere and just kind of have him laugh, you know, like, oh man, like, what were we doing? But you know, like you got to start somewhere, you know, and like the stuff that I'm making today is the best stuff that I've ever written, the best stuff I've ever created, but like none of it would have happened if I hadn't written those songs earlier or even the cheesy boy band songs, you know? Um, So there was that period of freestyling in a car, home recordings, and then when I went to Bethel College, uh, I joined a rock band, which I had no, no business singing for a rock band, but it started out, there was a girl that I liked in the dorm. We started dating. I said, I want to write her a song. And I've got a dude two doors down who plays the guitar. Talked to him one night, wrote a song. Next thing you know, there's a guy coming in playing the bass, guy coming in drumming. And we wrote a song called Honey Colored Eyes. I sat on the bridge and I sang it to her, had the guys playing behind me. Nice. Very scenic. You know, we dated for, you know, about two months. It didn't last very long. (laughs) You, You wrote a song for a girl after dating her for two months? Oh, it was, no, I wrote a song for her after like two weeks. What are you talking about? And I don't know whether it was more to woo her or if it was just because I just liked writing songs and I had an excuse to, you know what I mean? I was feeling something. It's a crush. It was a new relationship. There were feelings and those feelings could be converted to words. And then on top of that, I had people who were willing to play music behind it. So why not? And then when that was over, uh, more hip hop home recordings in our dorm rooms. And I, and at that point I started to like experiment and do some new things. And, uh, and I began to find my footing a little bit, but content wise, I wasn't there. Right. So at the time rap was still very just braggadocious. You know, you just talked about how awesome you are. And it's like the first one I wrote that I felt like, well, this is like a new level of awesomeness for me was called time to shine. And I thought like, man, this is, I've got something here. You know, I should keep building at this. I, so I just wrote song after song after song, but eventually college was over and those guys with the computer and the home recording stuff and the people that I created with, they all went away. The next thing you know, I'm a father and a husband and life started to kind of happen around me. And, and you know, when you have kids at a young age, all of your friends who don't have kids just kind of disappear. And that was weird too. Your common denominator isn't necessarily music. It's not, it's nah. that you have kids, we have kids, we're at the same stage of yeah. life. So I'm working to support a family. And when I would mention to anybody that I made rap music, it would just kind of get a chuckle at best. Like, oh yeah. And I'd show it to them and like, okay, like that's cool. But you can tell you're recording it at home on a computer or something. And it, it just got real discouraging. So I eventually gave it up until the Rhymer Educator Project began. So you created an album and you've got how many songs on there? There's a, there's 15 songs and four skits. Yeah. On the Rhymer Educator Project. 19 total tracks. Yeah. And then you've also put out an EP or just a two track kind of. Yeah. What's that called? I mean, I think they still classify it as a single, even though it's two songs. Yeah. Okay. And so you've, you, how many songs, I guess what I'm getting at is how many songs have you put out? So if you count Honeymoon and Chain Reaction, which didn't get on the full album, that's, do you count the skits or no? I don't. Okay. So, so take away those four. So 15 plus Honeymoon and Chain Reaction. So 17, Sick Day and Who Am I? So 19 songs in 2018 that were released. That's, a, that's quite a bit. No, it was much more. I thought it was going to be 10. Like I was shooting for 10. I remember talking to you about that. And if after the first couple that you had recorded and uh, yeah. man, if you can get up to a full album of that 10 songs. Would, yeah, it just seemed and it seemed like I couldn't even touch that. And then I had people who were just like, oh, it's really cool what you're doing. And they started donating more than I would have ever thought like an individual would contribute. Your music has primarily been paid for by like crowdsourcing it. Yeah, through GoFundMe and you know, that still exists, you know, if you want to contribute, gofundme.com slash Mr. Ruiz demo. And that's just there because I funded the album surprisingly. And then I, I, but I enjoyed the process so much that I'm now in a place where I'm like, man, I can't imagine not creating now, but it's expensive to create in this way. And in order for me to do that, it's almost like I need the the approval of others and like their contributions and things, which are hard to, it's hard to ask people for money all the time, but it's also like, you know, if you can support me in any way, 
you know, I appreciate it. And then I have to also find other ways to bring in revenue. Like now that I've got a product, I've got an album, I've got to start doing some shows or selling some merchandise or just whatever I can do to try and make that habit consistent and be able to continue making music. How do you start with your songs? Do you buy the beat first and then figure out a rap to go around it? Do you write lyrics first and then say, okay, I'll find, you know, I'll find uh, somebody that's produced a a beat that goes with this. What is the process like for you? I've done it both ways, but the way that seems to work best for me is when I, I'll just shop for beats and I'll listen to you know, hundreds sometimes. I've spent hours just listening to beats before and and then I'll hear one and I'll think like that does something for me. And then once I once I have it, before I buy it, I'll try to write to it first. And if I write something to it and I'm like, oh, like this could be really good, then I'll buy it. Because at that point there's that connection to it and that you know, and I've got something I, I know I can create to it. Because sometimes you'll hear a beat and I'm like, ah, that's really cool. You try to write to it and you're like, I'm just not, the story is not coming out or what I want to say is not coming out. And so if you would spend, you know, however much money on it, that'd be a waste of money because that idea is not there. Um, But usually if I hear a beat and I connect to it, I can write a song relatively quickly. And uh, then it's just about bringing that to life. So you don't have like a notebook filled with like pages of lyrics that you already have or anything like that. I have the notes thing on my iPhone, you know, and I'll and I'll just sit and I'll write lyrics and stuff or ideas for lyrics sometimes. But usually that doesn't become whole verses. That becomes just like a line. And I'll take that line and put it in a song. So like uh, one of them that I released in October was called Who Am I? And there's a lyric that's like, no VMA, but I'm TMJ because I grind so hard my teeth hurt. You want to hear me when your radio play. You liking the words that I use? Maybe you like I'm a teacher. No VMA, but I'm TMJ because I grind so hard my teeth hurt. And I actually do have TMJ. I have to wear mouth guard and stuff when I sleep. But like that line was one of those in my in my cell phone notes lines that I, that I wanted to work into a song somewhere. And I threw that in there. There's a lot of those like scattered thoughts. Do you have a favorite line you wrote? I feel like in every song, there's at least a phrase where I'm like, that's my favorite part of that song. And like without that little part, the song would have maybe felt generic to me. Mm -hmm. But like that, that part made it something that I really am proud of. The new things that I'm working on are all about how can I, because you have to understand the Rhymer Educator Project was, oh my gosh, I'm able to create an album. I've wanted to do this forever. This is a dream come true. And so like, it was a culmination of, like I was taking from verses that I had written in college 10 years ago or whatever, and fitting them into songs on the album. Like So Hot, So Cold was written before I met my wife. But I was like, but I I always loved that song and it never got to be something. And so I'm like, I, I had to call it up to the majors, you know? And now that that project's done, all of my old material that I'm proud of mixed in with some of the new material I wrote for the album, it's like, well, that's that happened. And now if I'm going to go forward with this thing, now I get to create all new. And I'm listening to rap music more today than I listen to any other type of music because I'm making it. Not because I want to take anything from anybody, but because like, I just want to know like what's, what's out there. And it's entertaining to me every Friday when Spotify drops a whole bunch of new albums to just go through and listen to every rap album. And I'd say nine out of 10 of them, I don't really care for, but occasionally I'll find like a gem. And I don't know, what is it about this album that just really gets me? Recently has been delivery. How can you not just have like a verse set up where it's one kind of rhyming pattern throughout the entire verse, but how can you like change up little phrases to just, sound different i don't know to somebody who doesn't really get into it or nerd out about it like i do it's probably not as exciting but like say in the song that i'm working on like or that i just recorded a song called uh her but i've got this verse and my feelings ascend from a means to an end to a friend to a confidant a trusted mind persona grata nonchalant i could build a life with her in confidence i could blur the lines and comfort hard times and on and on go on appreciate her open the blinds like lord and savior hoping to find some for me later i'll be the perfect date like april 25th my feelings ascend from a means to an end to a friend to a confidant a trusted mind persona grata nonchalant i could build a life with her in confidence i could blur the lines and comfort hard times and on and on go on appreciate her open the blinds like lord and savior hoping to find time for me later that's a uh, Miss Congeniality reference. Um, the Sandra Bullock movie. <laughs> this dumb person, uh, one of the 
contestants is they were like, well, what, what is the perfect date? They meant like an evening out in the town or whatever. She's like, Oh, it'd be April 25th. Like all you need is a light jacket. <laughs> so that was just a joke. Like April 25th, Herbie the one I'm with this magic, her in a light jacket, her in a whole nother bracket. Herbie like the first time that I ever heard Janet. So like just a little, like where you can accent words and where you can't like changing it. So it's not all the same thing throughout. I've begun to challenge myself to do that more. Uh, even recently, rather than just rhyming whole words, rhyming like syllables or little accents within words to make them sound the same, even if the two words don't traditionally rhyme. You know what I mean? Like, it's kind of like putting this really big, fun puzzle together for me. And uh, and I just have a heck of a time doing all that. So I'm going to name some hip hop artists and then you give me your opinions on them. I feel like this is a trick because you're always no. texting me about artists and I'm like, I've never heard of them before. No, 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 no. I'm not. I, you, you could say I, I, I don't have an opinion on them. Okay. 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 But you got to keep the opinion somewhat short so we can get through these. Okay. So okay. it can be one word. It can be a couple words, whatever. Okay. All right. We'll start with this. Lil Wayne. I have such mixed feelings about Lil Wayne. I can't listen to a full Lil Wayne album. His voice gets on my nerves. Um, but like lyrically, he, he says some really clever things. He's a punchline rapper, and uh, you know, not every joke hits for me. Dr. Dre. Great production, so many classics, especially early in my childhood that I gravitated towards. I wish he wasn't such a perfectionist because it, uh, it keeps his art from the rest of us who would love to hear it. Nas. A lot of classic albums. Nas is, is a big deal for me, but I, I love Nas less because he's Nas and more because Common wouldn't be Common without Nas. Jay Z, the greatest. Eminem, maybe overrated. Eminem is extremely lyrically talented. Do you know you're gonna get a diss track now? I know. No, I just so Eminem. Like I don't know. Eminem might agree with this. You know, maybe he, I don't know. Maybe he's come to a point where he just thinks he's the greatest too. But like, like for me, Eminem had a great endorsement in Dr. Dre. He was the only white guy doing it at the time. And he was really innovative and really inventive and also really willing to say things that a lot of people wouldn't say. And so, like, it was the perfect storm for his success. But, like, now in the landscape of rappers from the time that I've been a kid to, like, where I'm at now, I don't know that I would even put him in, like, my top 20. What about Drake? I think he's the greatest marketer in hip-hop music. Kendrick Lamar. I think he's special. And I think that he... I mean, even just what he did with the Black Panther soundtrack. And I think he, I don't know, I think he's important. And I, I can't really articulate why. His music's good, but there's something special about it. That's, it's more than just the product. Cardi B. <laughs> At 4 a.m. this morning, I got a notification on my phone and I couldn't sleep. And it pinged and it said Cardi B started a live video on Instagram. And I clicked it. And she was talking about all the things she had eaten that day. Nicki Minaj. Nicki Minaj is an uh, extremely talented rhymer. But like a lot of people nowadays, their shenanigans and like the way that they talk and their personal beefs and things like that become uh, more highlighted than their actual work. Puff Daddy. Um... Good businessman, long track record of success. I know I loved his hits in the 90s. Travis Scott. Overrated. LL Cool J. LL's, I mean, he doesn't really rap anymore, but he's one of those people that I always appreciated, like Common. He would create an album that was like, and I'm doing this now, where this album is kind of... Uh, a throwback soul rap record. This album is like love songs. I feel like a, a lover, not a fighter right here. This album is me being real hard and aggressive because I just feel like I've got something to prove in that arena and mama said knock you out. And so like they'll just fall into these pockets or these moods and they'll create something that that holds that place in history for them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and I always like that about artists. They're like, they have a really well-rounded catalog because they've let their moods translate into what they create. Chance the Rapper. I love Chance the Rapper. Uh, Me too. You know, he, 
he's investing a lot in education. Some people say he's like self-righteous and stuff, but I think those people are lame. Um, he just seems like a good dude. Tupac. Tupac is, he holds a special place in hip hop history, not just because he died in his prime, but also because he, he didn't fit in with either group, right? So he spent time with the gangsters and spoke that language and he did it better than they did. And he became a poster boy for them. But he was also a very thoughtful and intelligent guy who could have changed the world in a way equal to, and some people would hate that I say this, like, well, like, like akin to like a Martin Luther King Jr. or something like where his thoughtfulness could positively change people. And, and he was ahead of his time lyrically in some of the things that he said, even with regards to like social justice or things that are at the forefront of conversation now. He was talking about them in the 90s. And he was just, you know, I don't, I don't know, where that wasn't explored as much. So he was innovative and, and special. You probably know this, so I'm just going to get this on. Who killed Tupac? Uh, I don't know. Suge Knight. I mean, right, is that, is that a thing? Can we agree to that? Or do we think? Yeah, well, well right, because there's, there there's some people that think, like, you know, P. Diddy, right? I right, mean, yeah. But... It, is it is it Suge Knight or what? Suge Knight seems to be. I'm not gonna lie. If I profile Suge Knight, I think oh, that dude so, looks so like, like he looks yeah. like a comic book supervillain. He he yeah, he's like the kingpin. Yep. So like if Tupac is John F. Kennedy, then Suge Knight is Lee Harvey Oswald. Seems like the most likely suspect. While like Diddy's like the guy on the grassy knoll or you know whatever. Two more rappers, probably two of the most famous. Kanye West. What are your opinions? My opinions change daily. Cause like, so does Kanye's. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I don't really understand Kanye West. Like I can't get inside his head. How do you, how do you empathize or see where somebody is coming from? Where as soon as you begin to kind of get a grip, they pull the rug out from underneath you and they're somewhere else. So there's that. But like, I have to separate Kanye West, the person from Kanye West, the musician. Because what I know is the College Dropout's one of the top 10 rap albums on my list of all time. I love Late Registration. I love Graduation. I didn't love 808 and Heartbreak, but he was like the first one doing the auto-tune thing. Uh, you know, you say T-Pain too, but like that he helped to popularize that trend in hip hop for some time that Jay-Z eventually killed, ironically. My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy was just so creative and different and edgy. It was like somebody took musical theater and made it a hip hop record. You know, and like that was cool. But then, you know, I didn't love Jesus and I didn't love the life of Pablo. It's like Jay Z said, people want my old stuff by my old album. You know, like I get that there's that element too. People are just going to keep creating and you can take it or leave it. But he's had some classics. And so, like, he deserves respect for his place on the, on the timeline. Final rapper, Vanilla Ice. <laughs> no. All right. Rammer Educator, Joe Reese, thank you so much for joining me on my podcast. Do you want to um, let people know how they can connect with you online and listen to your music? Where do they go for all that? Okay, so you can go to Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all at Rhymer Educator, or, you know, on Facebook, it's like facebook.com slash Rhymer Educator. Um, but I'm Rhymer Educator everywhere. And if you just Google Rhymer Educator or even... Um, if you rhymereducator.com is my Bandcamp page where I really want to get a website. I don't know how to create one and I'll have the money to create one until more people donate, which you can do at the GoFundMe page. Um, but I'd love to have a, a website where I can just sell things from like music from the website directly and have links to all my streaming stuff because I feel like I'm not truly official until I get that. But so far I don't got that. So if you are a web designer and you hear this, help me out. Uh, but other than that, yeah, just find me Rhymer Educator everywhere. Well, Joe, I appreciate you. Um, you're a good friend, and I'm glad that you came on uh, the podcast today. And uh, I hope everyone checks your music out. Me too. Um, it's good stuff. I'm a big fan. You know that. And I hope you come back on the podcast sometime, man. This was a lot of fun. Me too, because now I'm going to walk away and think like, oh, this, all this stuff we didn't talk about or all the things that I should have said or the things that I said that I shouldn't have said. And, you know can't go from there welcome to my life buddy <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks for listening bye-bye
wash today Sunlight had a sense of urgency When I heard her say Read a hush shit lay That she earned his day Wish that I could stay Whoa Check the time on my phone Rome wish I had a schedule Like it own But I'm torn by the conflict Leave her alone It's the clash Now I should have stayed Should I go Oh no This decision Decision Every second with her Is the second I'm missing I just have a mission I'll be in bliss With the prettiest Pity said he ever witnessed Whoa Already running Stay home. Uh. 